This is a special edition of Somerville Neighborhood News focused on Union Square. Attend some of the planning meetings and hear from city officials and from US2 about who will negotiate the CBA, about whether or not US2 will build 925 housing units in the square, and hear what some of your neighbors think about the planning process. All this on this special edition of Somerville Neighborhood News. Hello, and welcome to this special edition of Somerville Neighborhood News. Today is March 24th. I'm Jane Regan. And I'm Yu Xiaoyuan. Somerville Neighborhood News is your bi-monthly newscast and online source for multimedia news. It's a community service production of SCAT TV, created by staff, interns, and your neighbors. We bring you the news every two weeks on Channel 3 and on our website, somervilleneighborhoodnews.org. This is a special edition of the news. We're focusing uniquely on the redevelopment of Union Square. There have been a lot of meetings recently and lots of buzz in the papers. Yes, and there was also a protest. We want to look an in-depth look at what's going on. That's right. On March 9th, 10th, and 11th, there was a charrette at the old post office, a series of meetings whose objective was to get input from people, and then the city and Union Square master developer US2 presented some plans, especially for D2 and D3, right? Yes, the Union Square redevelopment project concerns about 12 acres of property on seven blocks. A consortium of developers and architects called Union Square Station Associates, or US2, was chosen to be the master developer. Because the Green Line Station near Union is already under construction, US2 and the city are hurrying up the plans and the construction for two of the blocks, called D2 and D3. Okay, so at the post office on March 10th, there were a bunch of sessions aimed at specific stakeholders, right? Which ones did you attend? I was at several. We don't have time to cover all of them, but let's take a look at some of the comments and the concerns raised at the session on affordable housing. And actually, there was some confusion on what affordable housing really means. Yes, it's a little complicated. We did a story on that last year. Actually, it's basically homes that are rented or sold at rates that are lower than market rates. There are several levels of eligibility, all based on the median income for this area, which is pretty high. Usually, an agency or nonprofit tries to have units that are available for low and also for very low income people. The greater Boston area has a major shortage of affordable housing, meaning that families and even single people with medium income jobs like me can't easily afford to live around here. So when a developer builds new housing, he or she has to make a certain percentage of them affordable. Yep. I think what you're saying is there's poor, there's middle, there's average. We need, where can we get this information? Because otherwise, you're asking us to buy into this affordable housing without even knowing if it's affordable. For a family of four, very low income would be $47,000. A low income family would be $75,000. A moderate income family would be $103,000. I understand where that state is coming from, but I, I just want people to realize that when you guys talk about affordable housing, it's really not for the true poor. Okay. If you're talking about someone making $25,000 a year, a quote unquote affordable one bedroom apartment would be like $600, which is still high. Like she's saying, like that is legitimately too high for a lot of people. A while ago, I was in the high school and the mayor was, you know, like the city support, um, the 20% and TOD areas. Are you giving recommendation to US to, to um, go beyond and maybe, you know, like propose what is, you know, like in the draft of the zoning code for TOD area, which is 20%. If you look at every special district referenced in the, in the zoning ordinance, uh, under the proposed zoning ordinance, in the, the chart that, that assigns percentages, is every single one of them is 20%. So uh, if the Union Square process ends up in a special district to get the level of development that we want and the commercial mix that we want, then following our model, we would have a 20% requirement. Are there going to be units? built in this development that we're talking about right now in Union Square that are going to potentially be uh, income-based, you know, rent. So they would be project-based sub subsidies where uh, a person will pay 30% of their income, even if their income is like, you know, $900 a, a year. 
if they happen to have subsidies already, of course, that, that's, a, that's an easy answer for that, and then that would be tied to their income. But otherwise, right now, we don't have another program that could match that kind of subsidy on, ongoing. I heard a lot of people speak to the need to provide um, both inclusionary housing and other kinds of affordable housing for very low and low income families and, and individuals that have fewer options. Um, and so one of the things that um, Union United is putting forward as part of a proposed community benefits agreement is actually a much higher percentage in Union Square of affordable housing than that even inclusionary zoning would call for and having that be divided so that significant portions go to very low and low income households. Thanks, Yu Xiao. So it seems like Union United wants more than 20% of the new housing to be affordable? Yes, that's right. But how do they decide who gets that housing? Good question. Once there are apartments or condos available, there's a lottery. I think that almost 1,000 people and families applied for the 31 units at St. Polycarp's last year. There's just not enough affordable housing around. So what other sessions did you attend? I went to the one aimed at small business owners. Let's take a look. And my concern is that we are feeling, continuing to feel that pressure of expansion, mm -hmm. of the lack of affordability from Cambridge, Kendall in particular being the closest proximity, both in terms of residential and in terms of business. And those people are looking for more affordable spaces, and I don't really want to go to Revere or Malden. Right. You know, I need to have a little bit closer proximity to my client base, and I like this neighborhood, so I want to stay in this neighborhood. I can already see that the the tax increase yep. and the rent increase has pushed businesses out. Yep. But uh, my my concern is that's going to happen more and more, and yep. there's going to be this dead zone, like a calm before the storm, before where where the, the square becomes like emptiness. <laughs> you know, and that's a good point. And one of the things that we've heard a lot is that businesses right now there's so much uncertainty as to what's going to happen in Union Square. People know that development's coming but they don't really know the timeline, they know the T is coming but they don't really know when because we don't know is our property going to be taken by the domain? Are we going to be forced to sell? Are we going to be able to afford it here in the future? And so I think that's creating this this really anxiety among both business owners and property owners in the square right now and that's why we're starting to see some of the vacancies. So what we're trying to do, I mean hopefully as part of this process we, we come to a when we have this neighborhood plan and we have a better understanding as to what the future looks like, hopefully that will create some of the uncertainty that people have been looking for moving forward, hopefully. And when we were at 20 Bow, so we have our we have our own spot now, but I think that it it definitely took probably three months plus minus longer than it needed to um, because of the permitting process. And then there's also this kind of feeling that the the actual city of Somerville is making it incredibly difficult to both open a business and maintain that business. Somehow we noticed this picture in the summertime and an event happening Saturday. That Saturday that day, the we out. <laughs> Same, yeah. and that's, and that's yeah. 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 because yeah. we have people from all over mm -hmm. Comes and they don't Maine, know New Hampshire, what's everywhere happening in Union Square. Mm -hmm. So they close one-way street, they so used to coming in, and then they make you turn, they end up going someplace else. Mm -hmm. So they're gonna say, forget it, I'm not going there. So our business is down to like 70% off. Something like that is happening repeatedly. It's no good. It's very hard to catch up and you lose it in the weekend. I think one real worry is with construction about, we saw it how disruptive it was doing Somerville Avenue. It looks beautiful now, but it was three years yep. of hell. Yep. And there were lots of promises of like, oh, we'll even put up signs about uh, local businesses are still open. We'll right. put up little walkways to get into the businesses and it didn't happen. Yep. So if there could be some guarantees yep. and that if the c contractors or the city don't follow through, that there's cash back to the businesses. Mm -hmm. Because if you're two weeks out, if you, if you don't have customers for two weeks, that can take some of these businesses down. They're yep. operating in really small margins. Yep. Yep. So anticipating Prospect Street's going to be a mess, Webster Street's going to be a mess, the Plaza's going to be a mess. How can we do things that are going to co concretely 
be money into the pockets of the local business owners. Union Square is really special because of all the locally owned businesses, don't you think? Yes, I think so. And the US too knows that also. They've been launched a program aimed at helping the locally owned businesses. We'll have a report on that in our next newscast, right? Yes, we will. In the meantime, it's definitely going to be tough for the businesses to hang in there throughout this construction process, but I sure hope they can. I think there's also been some talk about having some of the community benefits agreement programs help them. Yu Xiao, you attended the session on the CBA, or community benefits, right? Yes, there's been a lot of discussion about that. Did the SNN do a big story on CBA? Yes, uh, people should check it out. It's on our January 27th newscast, and the story was also printed in the Somerville Journal. Viewers can find it on our website, somervilleneighborhoodnews.org. Just put union into the search engine. But can you explain what a CBA is? Yeah, sure. It's an agreement that's usually between a private developer who stands to make a profit on an area that it's developing and the community. Sometimes it's local community groups who sign the agreement, sometimes it's City Hall, and sometimes it's both. In the agreement, the developer makes certain promises about the amount of green space, how much affordable housing, and other givebacks. I know that groups like Union United, Union Square Neighbors, and many others have called for the city to include community groups in the agreement, right? Yes, they have. The city says it will take into account the advice of the Civic Advisory Committee, which is a group appointed by City Hall. But note that the city has said that it will only listen to the advice of the committee, not necessarily follow it. Let's take a look at some highlights of the CBA session on March 10th. Okay. The CAC will take input from everybody in the community that wants input, but then the CAC will draft the CBA. So who's going to actually like sit in a room with Greg and, and be like, this one, yes, no? Yeah, so, so the CAC was set up to be the full community organization through the city's nomination process and seating process on the CAC for handling the community recommendations on the CBA. The city ultimately has the power to accept or not accept uh, the CBA recommendations. That agreement will ultimately be signed between, between US2 and the Redevelopment Authority because it was the Redevelopment Authority acting on behalf of the city that designated US2 as the master of developer. Will the CAC be writing the CBA? Well, we'll write a recommendation. A recommendation, so you are a sounding board. You don't well, have a decision making. Well, That's critical. I, That's an important piece. I think you're trying to parse things a little bit finer. You know, we, we made a recommendation on a go. Right. We, we narrowed it to four developers. That was our role. It wasn't anybody else's role, but we narrowed it to four developers. And then we made a recommendation on a ranking of developers, putting two of them at the top. One, one was Gertie Nedling and one was US2. And I think this will be a similar process. Just wanted to point out, uh, Wig is one of four members of the CAC who are in this room. And I think he's quite right that it would be really good for the CAC to have a, have a key role. But I also think people should realize and remember, the CAC, CAC chose Gerding Edlin 12 to 2. And the SRA then chose US 2, which is perfectly legal and perfectly appropriate. The CAC was appointed. It wasn't you know, elected. Um, it is not representative of the population of Somerville. Um, you know, there's a sense from you guys that we don't want to talk about the process, we want to talk about the benefits, but this is not the right process, and we don't want to, like, I don't know how to guarantee myself or the other folks in the room that that's not what you guys are going to use to go back and say these are the benefits we need in our plan. So I don't want to see those numbers up there. No one was even told they would be voting on community benefits when they came to these sessions. So we got to better, do a better job of communicating and I think that's why we need a really clear CBA negotiation process. Union United is represented as a legal entity by three of the community groups that are members. Um, we're not playing around. We really seriously want to engage in discussions with US2 
to make this development a good one? Well, the Civic Advisory Committee was recently expanded a little to make it a little bit more representative, but people were still really upset. Yes, they were. Many of them were part of the protest the next day on March 11th. Who's Somerville? Our Somerville! Who's Square? Our Square! Who's Somerville? Our Somerville! Where do we live? Union! How do we live? United! Land for people, not for profit! coalition working to make sure that Union Square redevelopment re results in benefits, not displacement, for the Union Square community. Over the last year, Union United created priorities for an Equitable Community Benefits Agreement, or a CBA. That reflects our visions and that we want to negotiate with US too. We have over 100 residents 15 community groups, 14 local businesses, four religious congregations, immigrant groups, and labor unions, and Union United. Throughout the years, we work as a small business really hard to make our business profitable and better for us in the community. We put a lot of effort, money in our hearts and our business. We make a lot of progress until this point, but nothing is concrete. There's been a lot of talking about business and people who will come here to work and live in Somerville. But how about, what about us who are here now? We have been contacting the mayor's office, requesting a meeting with the mayor so we can share with him our thoughts and we can listen their ideas too. We know that he cares a lot about the Union Square as much as we do. Together, I'm sure that we will make this happen. I'm very proud to be a part of this group. Thank you. I lived in Somerville for most of my life, but for about three years of my life, I lived in Everett. It was okay, but I didn't find it home. I, come back, I came back to Somerville around seventh grade and I could not be happier. I love this city so much and I really believe that it's the place where I belong and it really is my home. But the thing is, is that the same way that I moved to Everett, my friends, my colleagues, my peers, they too have been forced out of Somerville because they can't afford to live here. It's just so painful for a city that's so famous about its diversity to have gentrification happening everywhere and for the city to lose its credibility and I want to be able to say in the to the developer that we are all staying here. So on the night of the protest, what else went on? US2 did a big presentation about their plans and about all the possible variations. It went on really late and there was no time for any discussion. That got people upset also. I spoke to a few of the participants. Here's Stu Beckman, who's been active in civic life for years. I discovered long ago that first you listen, and then you talk. These guys are talking, and they're not listening. And the thing that's embarrassing is that they mean to listen. They mean to tell, to, to give everybody a lot of information. Too much information is too little data. I mean, too much data is too little information. And they, they have totally distorted the kind of, the kind of, intelligence they want from the group. If they want it, they should have four or five sessions that are small and friendly with coffee, largely in, these, in, the, in the coffee houses on Union Square. And they should be talking to people and they should be using your camera to talk to people and collect information as it comes across. But you never have a large group and then never listen to them. That's exactly what they've done. Wow, that was really intense. 
Uh, so, Yushao, last week you also spoke to city planner George Proekis, right, about the CBA process? Yes, the city had set up a kind of voting process. I asked him to explain it and also to talk about whether or not the city would allow Union United and other groups to sit at the negotiating table to sign the document. So this, the Community Benefit Store, is a uh, way that we learn through the neighborhood plan process a little bit more about what people in the neighborhood consider to be amongst the most important things they want to get in terms of community benefits. A lot of times when you're able to do a significant amount of development in a neighborhood, there's the ability for the community to share in the benefits that come back to the developer, say through programs for additional affordable housing, for the opportunity to pay for some small business assistance, and we're asking folks how we would split funds up and where our priorities are while we do this. What we ask people here to do is say, theoretically, if we gave you $100 of community benefits, and we represent the $100 in terms of these little poker chips here, and we have 20 of them, each is worth $5, how would you split your $100? Housing vouchers, green space, additional affordable housing, we said, you know, split your chips based upon what is most valuable. So as we've had folks come in, we give each person 20 chips. We let them divide them across the bins in whatever they think is the most appropriate way. And at the end, we'll look. It doesn't mean we're necessarily going to have the, um, these future community benefits arrangements work directly this way, but it helps us learn more about where the community's priorities are. There was the protest. Uh, Union United organized the protest. Yes. So people hoped that if there is any possible that the community can sit on the table and sign the CBA with the de developer directly. What we are working to have happen is to have the entire community of anybody who wants to participate have the chance to sit around the table and express their concerns through the CAC process, the Citizens Advisory Committee, about what they believe should be in a community benefits agreement and how that agreement should be structured. Um, we as a city are looking to make sure that we get as much input, as much participation, and as much opportunity for everybody, whether they're a part of an organized group or not part of an organized group, to be able to have the opportunity to participate in the process. And at the end, be able to um, have the city as a whole put that, put, put that arrangement together based upon all those voices and reach the point where we can develop an agreement that works for everybody in Somerville. Mm -hmm. What we're going to do working with the CAC in the next few weeks and months is set up what that process will be and how the community input process will work with that through the CAC. I hope through that process we can build confidence with everybody in the community that their voices will be heard and, and we'll have an opportunity for everybody to be involved in that process. Um, at the end of the day, as we see it, um, the city, on behalf of all, all of its residents, signs a community benefits agreement with a developer, but we do that um, with the opportunity for everyone to have an equal chance to be heard in that process. Hmm. So he basically said that the city will listen to others, including the Civic Advisory Committee, but that only the city will sign. Yeah. So were there any other meetings? Yes, there was one last night that we couldn't get to, the Civic Advisory Committee. But we did go to a question and answer session on March 19th. It wasn't that exciting and not many people were there. But I was able to do some interviews. First, I talked to Brett Rawson from the city's economic development office. So can you tell me uh, a little bit about what are on these boards? Sure, sure. The Summer by Design process is a really visual community planning process. It's a really low stakes way for us to test ideas and then give folks the opportunity to actually think about which ones they like and don't like and tell us which ones to spend more time to try to bring them to life. So for example, some of these boards um, will literally have six or seven different ideas about a specific intersection, about a specific development block, about an idea for a new park or plaza space in the square. We don't necessarily know which ideas people will get the most excited about, so it's important that we provide them a menu of choices. Okay, so people who attended, like um, including Wednesday's presentation and the little sessions are only a small group of the community. So how will the city, uh, what will the city do to reach out a broader 
body. Um, it's important for our city planning staff to make sure that people in the community have every opportunity to participate in this important discussion. Sometimes that means to hold a community meeting at night. Sometimes it means to have a 9 a.m. to 9 p.m. opportunity like we had last week for three days straight. Um, it's really, really important for our staff to be out there on the block talking to small business owners, talking to average residents who might not come to a community meeting. We're going to local churches. We're going to the community organizations who work here in the square um, because it's important that we bring these opportunities to people where they are in addition to the more traditional community meetings that we have. The Board of Aldermen, they just they passed their resolution uh, about the limit residential um, units in yeah, D2. So what is the city what is the city's uh, response to that? Well between 2009 and 2012, our community members came together in a volunteer-driven citywide comprehensive plan called Summer Vision. That plan is intended to guide growth and change throughout the next 30 years in the city. And one of the things that our volunteers during that process suggested was that new development should primarily be commercial with a balance of residential sprinkled in. Somerville's kind of a bedroom community. We have far too few jobs within our borders, which means that most of our residents need to leave Somerville every day to go to work. Having said that, we're not interested in building suburban office parks that turn off all the lights at 6 p.m. because they have no street life, because they have no residential units sprinkled in. That's one of the lessons that we have all learned from watching Kendall Square over the last 30 years. So our residents tell us that a mix of uses and a mix of activities is desirable, but that the emphasis should be on commercial and office development. So the 925 housing units is like, it's already decided? It will be there? No, no. We are very early in this process, and we have been working really, really hard to get a number of community members involved to help us understand priorities and goals in a one-year time frame, a five-year time frame, and even a 10 and a 20-year time frame. It's going to take a long time for all of these uh, development blocks to change. So, it seems like the plans for 925 housing units that has upset so many people isn't for sure. Yeah. Let's listen to what U.S. 2 President Greg Kaczewski said. People are not that happy about U.S. 2's plan of building 925 housing units on D2 and D3. So what is your response? Sure. You know, it was uh, we put, to, put together a proposal that we felt like was a very balanced proposal and looked at housing as an important element, which would include a component of affordable housing, as well as, you know, 600,000 square feet of commercial space that was really spread out between a hotel, retail, and a significant amount of office. Mm -hmm. Create a lot of jobs and create a lot of tax base. So I feel like the program actually is fairly balanced. Um, it was a proposal. You know, this is a, a process, a community-based process to arrive at a plan that, you know, meets the community objectives and is economically viable. And, you know, we're committed to the process and, you know, want to work with the community to refine, you know, refine the plan uh, in a way that'll meet everybody's objectives for, for the square. Mm -hmm. Huh, that's really interesting. I guess there's still some wiggle room in the planning for Union Square. Viewers who want to hear more on the housing issue should catch the March 24th edition of Greater Somerville at 7.30 p.m. on Channel 3 and online on the Greater Somerville YouTube channel. Yeah, I think people really need to stay involved. They can go on the Somerville by Design website to find the images that were displayed at the charrette and also to find a survey they can download and fill out. Well, Yuxiao, I just tried that. I have to say the site is not that well organized. So I suggest you go there, SomervilleByDesign.com, but then put Union into the search box. That way you'll find lots of articles, images, and also documents and that survey. Thanks, Jay. Well, that's it for tonight. We'll be back on April 7th at 7 p.m. on Channel 3. In the meantime, you can watch and read our news stories at SomervilleNeighborhoodNews.org. And you can check out our Facebook page, SCAT TV SNN. Share your favorite segments or tweet us at SCAT TV SNN. We welcome you to get involved with Somerville Neighborhood News. Become a reporter or just send in your ideas. Call us at 617-628-8826 or email us at news at scattvsomerville.org. I'm Jane Regan. And I'm Yu Xiaoyuan. Thanks for joining us and see you around the neighborhood. Yep.